Would you pray with me? Lord, we're thankful that you are worthy and that you are just and that you are right and you're gracious and kind. And Father, you have given us all that we need for life and godliness through your word. And we thank you for that. Father, if we are in a place where we find ourselves questioning your word, Lord, would those questions be welcome this morning? And would you do what you do best and give us peace and understanding in those questions? Father, would you challenge us appropriately where we need to be challenged? Would you give us hope where we need hope? And Father, would you speak through your servant this morning? We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be reading from our teaching this morning in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7. So I invite you to turn there in your paper Bible or, hey man, it's 2024, just Google it. <laughs> I thought that'd be funnier. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. 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 Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed them with oil who were sick and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. on uh, study leave last week. Um, someone was just telling me that they were talking to my daughter about it last week, and she apparently calls it study leave. <laughs> the d delightful part of um, my job where I'm working, but planning for the future for worship and sermons and other aspects of the church. And on study leave, uh, we listened to one another's sermons. I was with two pastors named Mike and Phil. Um, and they said that uh, they both gave me the same encouragement to work on. They said the sermon was fine. They gave me a lot of guff about how short it was, um, which I'm like, I don't think my people mind if it's a short sermon. <laughs> and they encouraged me to do better with my transitions um, when I moved from point one to point two. So I, I put that into my notes. And then another friend said the same thing, unprompted, who I respect uh, as a preacher. And the reason I'm telling you that is not only because I thought it was interesting and hopefully I'll grow as a preacher. I'd like to continue to grow as a preacher. And some of you are like, but you're already pretty good. And others of you are like, yeah, you could grow. <laughs> but also because uh, their point was sometimes you zag and people aren't ready for it tonally. They can't stay with you. Um, I was talking to my wife about this this morning and she kind of likes that. And I'm like, well, maybe that's because you're used to my sense of humor and we've been married 20 years and all that. The other reason I tell you is because Mark does that. Mark's portrayal of gospel, uh, uh, Mark's gospel is jolting. If you read it, and I encourage you to read it, it's disruptive. Things happen immediately. In the middle of chapter 6, after Jesus is rejected in Nazareth, then he sends the 12 out, which doesn't seem to make sense. And then right after that, there's a flashback scene to a very gruesome, horrific death of John the Baptist, which seems to disrupt Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist is very important forerunner. So while I'm going to try and get better at my transitions, Mark is not very concerned with that. And if you read the book, understanding that will enhance your understanding of Jesus. So the mission, which is to tell people to repent, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, and, and what Nathan read for us here in verse 12, that's the mission, telling people that they should repent. They should turn, that's what the word means, away from their way to God's way. Away from darkness to light. Away from the lies of the world, the lies that we accidentally tell ourselves to 
truth. And for us, repentance is both a one-time thing where we're saved by trusting Jesus, following him. It's also a daily grace. You know, the golden rule sounds nice. It can also be interpreted kind of shallowly, right? Because it kind of sounds like we're supposed to treat people the same. But that's not what it means. It means learn how to love people specifically. And repentance is the bridge between that idea and the truth of it. I live with four humans, two cats and a dog. This is where I want to say the thing about the cats, but I'm not going to because some of you love cats and that's legitimate. I, I don't, but it's okay. The four humans are all very different. They receive love differently. They love differently. Silence affects each of them differently. Words and tone and speed and time and gifts are all different for them. And part of repentance is learning to love them better. Three years ago, my wife asked me something very specific about our communication, and I kid you not, every day, it's effort for me to remember what she said and then to do it. I had an opportunity this morning. We talked about this. This was not even a fight. It's nothing negative at all. We had a conversation about how we're going to spend the afternoon. She told me, and then I wanted to circle back because of the way I work. And her request essentially was, you don't need to. And so I have to do this work in my head. I don't need to circle back before I leave for church. And so I didn't. And that's repentance. Not the repentance of turning to God, but in living in step with it. And I, I debated whether to talk about this during my sermon. Obviously, you can see where I landed on that. But the reason that I debated is the repentance the disciples are talking about is turning away from the world and to Jesus, receiving salvation. But the rest of the scripture talks about something that the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is our theological document as Presbyterians, calls repentance unto life where we receive the daily grace of turning away from our own ways towards God's ways. And in so doing, we're loving him and the neighbors in our life. And the reason that I um, want to encourage you, the, the, the mission is both preaching that the people should repent, verse 12, but also that we get to repent is because that's how you proclaim the kingdom. The, that's how you proclaim your citizenship around the world. To your closest friend who's a Christian, to your closest friend who's not a Christian, to a server at a restaurant or a flight attendant, the most the profound way that you proclaim the kingdom of God that's alive in you if you're a follower of Jesus is through the way that you repent on a daily basis to those people. The way that you live in a way that reflects the kingdom of heaven to them. It will involve words sometimes. It will always involve actions. It will often involve asking for forgiveness. Periodically, I have needed to ask for forgiveness for people that are not religious, and it is an awkward experience. And yet, that's what we get to do. And then, change and not treat them that way again in the future. So as we go through the book of Mark, what I am attempting to do is take one passage from a chapter and use that passage to highlight that chapter that our minds and our emotions and our understanding of Jesus grow. That we be gripped by who he is, what he did, and the mission of God. So while Nathan read verses 7 through 13, right before that, Jesus receives the first communal Jewish opposition. And Jesus has been opposed by all sorts of forces earlier in Mark. Demons not happy about Jesus showing up. There are religious leaders uh, that don't like what he's saying because they understood it. His family, twice, essentially told him he was crazy and he needed to stop telling people that you're God. Now he receives the first communal Jewish opposition. And this is a, it both happened and it's foreshadowing. 
The first people who would have heard the Gospel of Mark are probably Roman Christians, a mixture of Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus. And they were experiencing opposition. Legal opposition in Rome, because it was illegal to say Jesus is Lord. Family opposition, people didn't understand their new allegiances. Religious opposition from various groups that did not like being told your way is actually false and our way is true. And so they would have been encouraged that Jesus was also rejected. They would have understood that this is the parable he told in chapter 4, displaying its truthfulness in, his very, in Jesus' ministry, that some would reject. And look at their questions. This is in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Where did this man get these things? What's the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. What do you think of their questions? Are they like your questions? When you pray about your questions about God or your life or his plan, what's that like? Are they at all like these questions? When you think about your questions, because you have them, and they're either festering or they're being engaged. When you talk with trusted friends about your questions, when you read books about these questions, because we're blessed with hundreds and hundreds of authors who are good conversation partners. It's a little ringy again, Simon. What's it like when you read about and think about and pray about and discuss your questions? There's a Bible study in our church called Gray Power and they're reading a book on heaven. Carol Moger's in that Bible study, and she's 95, and it's still worth her while to continue studying the things of God that her mind and heart are enlivened and grown in it. Your questions are either uh, festering or you're engaging them. And I say that not only because I think it's true, not only because the people in Nazareth had these questions of Jesus that they were not really engaging well, but also because the disciples are starting to um, internally at least misunderstand, if not oppose, the things of Jesus. Mark hits this theme a little bit harder than the other gospel writers. And thank God, because when we accidentally or on purpose oppose Jesus, we have some good friends and his direct followers, the disciples, and we feel a little bit less crazy with respect to our own decisions and minds. At the end of the chapter, it'll say that the disciples were afraid and they didn't understand Jesus feeding the 5,000 that Will preached on last week, and it says their hearts were hard. And part of the reason for that is they weren't engaging all of their questions with Jesus. He continues to pursue and love them. And we have the same opportunity to engage, to pray about, to read about, to discuss, to think about our questions about our life, about God, about what it means to love and worship him and love those he's put into our life. The mission and the opposition continue. Following the section that um, Nathan read is this horrific flashback about the death of John the Baptist. There's a lot that could be said about this. I didn't want to preach on this text specifically, but again, I'm, I'm referencing it with respect to the mission of God and the mission of Jesus. In one sense, it's almost a parody if it wasn't so horrific. Is this king even in charge of his own faculties and emotions? Reminding us a little bit of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, the kings in Esther and Daniel. Because throughout the scripture, we, know, we learn or we realize again, there is one king who's in control. 
and no governor or president or king has more than an ounce of power that isn't God-given. It's also kind of a demonic alternative to the mission of God, this section of, about John the Baptist. Then Jesus feeds the 5,000, and in so doing, he is displaying that he is a new and greater Moses. By feeding people in the wilderness, if you're familiar with the Exodus story, by gathering them to himself and leading them, this is a dominant theme of the whole New Testament, that Jesus is a new Moses who leads us from a worse slavery, that to sin and death, into new life. What's the difference, though, between the feeding in Exodus and the feeding in Mark? Do you notice? This, I'm asking if you know your Bible well, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, or maybe you do, but you can't think of it because the way I asked. In the Exodus, when God miraculously feeds his people in the, in the desert, they are told explicitly, do not gather up the food. Remember that, the manna? And when they do, it goes poorly. Here, they are told to gather up what's left over of the miraculous feeding. Why? To the first listeners, they would have immediately thought of the Lord's table. Because this king is not leading them away from Rome. This king is giving them everlasting life and will continue to sustain them on this earth with his bread and wine, enlivening them for love of God and neighbor. That's why they gathered up the bread. This king is not about overthrowing Rome. This king is about giving everlasting life that starts the minute that we trust. And to the first listeners, almost certainly Rome and Israel were at war at the time. And so they were having as much trouble understanding the kingdom of God as we might, because it's not something that we can see. At the same time, they were comforted because Rome was winning that war and did win it, which does nothing to the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus walks on water. I'm in verse 45, and what I'm doing again is I'm pointing out how this relates to the mission that Jesus sent the disciples on, which is his mission. In verse 45, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when the evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. This is because the lake was several hundred feet below sea level, so very susceptible to huge wind. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. This is a deliberate reference to Exodus 33 and 34. The Jewish translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. That's that LXX. If you have one of those Bibles with a concordance, LXX, which means 70, um, is a reference to the Septuagint. It's the same verb. I know a lot, many of you don't care about that, but Mark is making a deliberate reference, saying Jesus is showing the disciples that he is God, that he's the same person that was there that passed by Moses in Exodus 33 and 34. And he meant to pass by them, but when they, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. This is very similar in, in uh, chapter 4 when he calmed the storm. Except this time he doesn't say anything. I wonder if one or two of the disciples were like, maybe Jesus is pretty powerful, but he was having a conversation with nature, and nature was like, okay, this time we'll calm down. I don't know if that's one of the disciples' questions, but this time Jesus doesn't say anything because it's not magic. He's not a powerful figure. He's God. When he said, it is I, anyone familiar with the, the book of Exodus would remember when God revealed his name to Moses, that's how he revealed it. And the mission and the opposition continue even as confusion grows. The disciples didn't fully understand. 
and yet the mission of God continues. The communities that Jesus visits are confused about him, but eager to receive his healing. I hope that's where you are, because he continues to heal today. And what I mean by that is he will help you understand why, and he will help you be able to walk through this world without being crushed by what's happened to you. That's what his healing looks like in your life. And what Mark 6 is displaying to us is that even when we're confused, he's still good that way. The disciples are confused, but they continue to follow, a little bit like us. We understand in part, but we continue to follow, because where else would we go? The religious leaders are not confused. They are opposed to Jesus, and their opposition will be... How do I say this? unpredictably folded into the mission of God and utilized to bring about our new life in him received through the punishment he endures on the cross. The mission and the opposition continue. Confusion about Jesus for us and for them persists, and yet he is still good, offering us new life in him. pray with me? Jesus, in our minds, would you help us to see you? And be drawn to follow you with our words, with our actions, with our decisions. We trust you, Lord, and ask that you strengthen and encourage us to trust you quickly and delightfully this day and this week and for the rest of our lives. Amen.